Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the first Physics of Life Network of Excellent, uh, Excellent seminar uh, for the current academic year, 2021 to 2022. It's very exciting uh, to have you all back. And um, we're delighted to welcome Professor Jack Shostak to uh, kick off the year in style. So um, before we get on to his talk, uh, I'd just like to note that uh, if you have a question to ask, please type it in the chat. And um, if it's suitably pertinent, I will I will interrupt Jack and we'll, we'll and we will stop and answer the question. There should also be uh, time for questions at the end, uh, sort of free for all. Um, please do uh, take a look at our YouTube channel uh, after this. We've got all of the talk, all the previous talks recorded. Uh, and available to watch there. Uh, and it's great to see um, quite a few subscribers to the channel, actually. So um, uh, let's keep let's keep that up. So um, without any further ado, it is my pleasure uh, to welcome Jack Shostak, who is Professor of Genetics at the Harvard Medical School and Alexander Risch, Distinguished Investigator at Massachusetts General Hospital. Although we are given to understand that he's soon to move to Chicago. So um, that, that biographical information will soon be out of date. But Professor Shostak made his name within genetics and indeed received the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine for his work on telomeres. However, more recently, he has focused on questions related to the origin of life. Uh, and it's on that topic that he's going to be talking to us today. So welcome, Professor, so welcome, Professor Shostak. Please take it away. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Tom. Thanks for inviting me to speak here. And uh, um, hello to all the uh, uh, students and uh, everyone else. Um, so yeah, as as you heard, uh, for in recent years, my laboratory is focused on questions relating to the origin of life. In fact, most of the work that we do is very much in the area of chemistry, uh, organic chemistry, a lot of it. Um, but in the course of this work, we run across many, many interesting um, questions that are more related to the physics of these complex systems. And so I'm going to talk about a couple of aspects there that we've uh, worked on uh, over the years. Uh, the, the image that you see in the background of, of this slide is kind of a, a schematic of what we're trying to get to. We're trying to reconstruct uh, the pathway from the chemistry and physics of, uh, of the surface of our Earth when it was a very young planet and understand how those environments, uh, sources of energy, uh, the chemistry and everything gave rise to primitive cells that we think looks something like this, some uh, uh, membrane envelopes in, enclosing small, small pieces of genetic uh, material, which we think were something like RNA. Um, let's see. So this is a more detailed view of kind of the same thing. We're, we're it, it turns out that actually building these, these kinds of systems is fairly trivial because actually membranes self-assemble. Uh, RNA molecules, given the right uh, chemistry, also self-assemble. The real trick and what uh, we focus on mostly is how to make these systems grow and divide. So the membrane has to grow and divide so that a cell can, or protocell can give rise to two daughter protocells. And at the same time, the genetic material has to replicate so that the information that's encoded in the sequence of that material can be passed on uh, to future generations and can also um, encode information that, that is in a sense about the environment that allows these protocells to adapt uh, become more complex and explore new uh, new environments. So I'm going to talk um, um, partly about the, the some of the physics of these uh, membrane systems, and and uh, later on about some aspects of of information 
uh, coated in, in, in these polymers. But before I begin, I, I, I do want to touch I on I, one just this briefly. The, the divergence is in a much more narrow range. Mm. Sorry, was there a question or? Um, okay. I think someone so has a want... microphone on. Yeah, just, just make sure all the microphones are off. Besides Jake, of course. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to just talk briefly about the issue of chirality, since this is such a fundamental uh, aspect of the physics of our universe, going all the way back to the, the 1950s and the discovery of the asymmetry of the weak uh, interaction. And so the origin of the homochirality of biological systems has been a very long-standing uh, question. Uh, just to introduce the topic, I've shown two very simple molecules here, which illustrate um, the, the issue of chirality, the, 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 which is that these are mirror image uh, configurations. So they're completely identical, except for their arrangement in three-dimensional space. And you can't transform one in, into the other uh, by any kind of uh, rotational or translational uh, manipulation. So in biology, we always or almost always see one-handedness of, of, the, of the building blocks, the amino acids, the sugars, the nucleotides, and so on. And the question has been, how, how did that arise? So th there's been a lot of progress in that area recently, um, to the point that, in a sense, we have uh, a superabundance of possible solutions. And, and the real question is, is, which one is the most relevant, and, and, and how did it actually come into play. So one aspect of this that's been studied for quite a long time, uh, and I think is a really uh, interesting and outstanding puzzle, is the fact that even in asteroids, uh, so we're talking about clearly uh, uh, abiotic origin, uh, we see um, an excess of one of one uh, enantiomer, one handedness of certain molecules over the other. And, and so that's just was seen in this one example here um, uh, in this study where they compared two uh, amino acids. These are non-biological amino acids. They're found in, in many different types of uh, meteorites, car carbonaceous chondrites um, primarily. Uh, and, and so here's a, a, a control where the two isomers are, are separated. And in a racemic uh, mixture, the two peaks are pretty much equal uh, height or area. But in the sample from a meteorite, there's an excess of the L over the D isomer. And, and how that arose is not really understood. The interesting thing is that this um, excess of L amino acids is seen in many different meteorites and leads to the at least hypothesis that there was some solar system wide phenomenon in the early in the history of our solar system that imposed this excess. And the predominant explanation for many years has been that there was, uh, that this could have been due to uh, circularly polarized UV light um, coming from uh, either a, a, some very nearby uh, hot star or possibly a supernova um, that, that actually affected the chemistry on, on, a, uh, on the large scale of the protoplanetary disk. So the actual mechanism, though, it, it's, is a question because all of the experiments that have been done on, in laboratories on the Earth show that, yes, you can get a small uh, excess uh, with circularly polarized light, but it's the, the excesses that are observed in meteorite uh, samples are, are generally larger than that, and, and so it's not clear uh, what, what actually happened. So there's been some really interesting work in recent years on alternatives to circularly polarized light. And one area that I find really fascinating is, is the fact that uh, spin polarized electrons can actually uh, influence chemistry and, and uh, lead to very high uh, selectivity. And, and so this can actually be seen in, in two complementary ways. Uh, so there's a, a phenomenon called uh, chirally-induced spin selectivity. So uh, 
if you uh, have a system where you 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 have um, the secondary electrons that are emitted from a surface and, and sort of forced to migrate through a chiral uh, monolayer, in this case, uh, DNA molecules. The, the, these chiral molecules act as a spin filter and the electrons that come out are uh, spin polarized. And in this particular experiment uh, done by, in a collaboration between um, Richard Rosenberg and Ron Neyman, they use the spin polarized electrons generated in this way to influence a, a very thin layer of, of this uh, uh, chiral molecule applied as a racemic mixture. And they could demonstrate a preferential chemical interaction between spin polarized electrons and one enantiomer over the other. So how this could actually come into play uh, in a prebiotic context is, is not yet clear, but I think the phenomenon is really interesting and deserves a lot of study, which indeed it's getting. Now, these kinds of influences can give you a relatively small, on the order of sorry, 10 or 20 percent excess of one uh, enantiomer over the other. Uh, but the, then the question is, how could you amplify uh, that kind of excess to 100 percent, which is what we think we need to actually get the chemistry of life started? And so I just wanted to mention a really uh, beautiful and amazing discovery made by Cristobal Viedma uh, now some 16 years ago that's variously called uh, crystal grinding or uh, chiral amnesia or sometimes Viedma ripening. And the idea is that if you start with a compound that makes right and left-handed crystals, you'll get initially an equal um, abundance of these two mirror image crystal forms. And if you just let those sit around or swirl them, nothing much happens. But if you grind the crystals with glass beads, you start a cycle in which the largest crystals get ground down to smaller and smaller crystals, which have a higher surface energy and therefore tend to dissolve even in the saturated solution and then recrystallize on the lower surface energy surfaces of the larger crystals. So you have a cycle of uh, mass transport uh, through this way. And this, somehow this input of energy lets or causes this system to diverge spontaneously to homochirality randomly in one direction or the other. Uh, uh, and, and, and so the solid phase becomes homochiral. Uh, and the beautiful thing is that this process depends upon the solution phase being racemic. And so this phenomenon has received a great deal of study in recent years by many people, including uh, Donna Blackman and, and many others, uh, so that the mechanism is actually fairly well understood. And you can even imagine how this could happen in a prebiotic context if you have a crystalline material subject to uh, you know, uh, grinding by sand gray grains in a turbulent environment. The mystery that still remains is how to couple this with the actual chemical pathways that we think are the most important places to introduce homochirality in, into the larger chemical system. So, so there's a lot of interesting puzzles that remain in the issue of chirality. Okay, so uh, that's all I'm going to say about chirality for now, and I'm going to switch over to talking about some of the very interesting properties of uh, a really soft form of uh, soft matter, and that is the membrane systems that are made um, by the self-assembly of uh, simple fatty acids. So, of course, our modern biological membranes are made of much more uh, complex uh, lipids, uh, typically uh, two-chain phospholipids. But it turns out, in work that goes back uh, decades now, that even simple single-chain fatty acids, uh, such as the one you see here, can spontaneously self-assemble into bilayer membranes that look just like cell membranes. The nice thing is these membranes are much more dynamic, and they have a lot of properties that look just right for uh, the membranes of primitive cells. And I'll explain more uh, what I mean by that in a few minutes. But one of the key 
uh, aspects of these uh, membranes is the phase behavior of the fatty acids. And this is dependent on uh, pH, uh, salinity, temperature, and so on. Uh, but the pH effect is, is the most important. And that is that at high pH, the carboxylates are fully ionized. And so the only stable aggregate form is small micelles that are uh, perhaps three nanometers in, in diameter. And the, obviously surface is highly curved, so that keeps the negatively charged carboxylates as far apart as possible, while allowing the hydrophobic uh, tails to interact with each other and exclude water. Now, as you lower the pH gradually, you get to a point where half the carboxylates are ionized and half are protonated. At that point, they can start to interact with each other strongly through hydrogen bonding networks, and that stabilizes the bilayer membrane uh, configuration that you see over here. So this allows uh, sheets to form. They have a high edge energy. And to minimize that edge energy, the sheets close up into more or less spherical vesicles. Um, and these can uh, encapsulate anything that happens to be uh, in the liquid environment at the time, including, for example, uh, RNA molecules, nucleotides, or other other, uh, basically anything that's in the solution. Now, if you drop the pH too far, these vesicles uh, collapse because when the carboxylates are all protonated, then the stable uh, phase is just oil drops. So uh, this allows us to actually uh, prepare membrane vesicles, but feed them with new, essentially food molecules, new fatty acids in the form of micelles. So these these are stable at high pH. We introduce the high pH uh, micelles feedstock into a lower pH system with vesicles. And now these become uh, thermodynamically unstable. And there's a transfer of a fraction of these molecules into the preformed, pre existing membrane, which then grows. Okay, so I want to show you what that looks like because the first time we actually saw this, it was a big surprise. We'd, studied that process uh, by indirect methods for many years. Uh, but when a uh, fantastic graduate student, Ting Zhu, uh, joined the lab, uh, he, he did this experiment. So we could actually watch the process of growth in the microscope. So here's a preparation of uh, fatty acid vesicles that Ting made. They're each about four microns in diameter. And what we're actually seeing is a fluorescent dye that's encapsulated in the interior aqueous space. And then, uh, so Ting then adds a new material in the form of uh, uh, micelles. And after a few minutes, um, the, you can see that they've grown. So we expected all of these vesicles to just gradually get larger and just, uh, you know, sort of slowly grow as, 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 as spherical shapes. And, and we were, uh, I have to say, more than a little bit surprised to see what actually happened, which is shown here. You can see these thin filamentous tails growing out of each of the original parental vesicles. And if you wait a little bit longer, about half an hour, then all of the original spherical vesicles have been transformed into these long extended filamentous shapes. And it's important to note that none of the contents have leaked out. Uh, so they're, they're sort of topologically intact. Um, and, uh, but the shape has undergone a dramatic transformation. And this is in part because of uh, the time scales of uh, surface area versus volume change. So the permeability of the membranes is, is causing a, a constraint on, on the increase of, uh, in the volume. Now, this phenomenon can be uh, iterated indefinitely. So you can take uh, spherical vesicles, add micelles, they grow into filaments. Then you agitate them, and they'll divide. So these filaments are very fragile. It doesn't take much in the way of uh, shear forces to cause them to fragment into small daughter vesicles, which, again, can grow if you add more food fatty acids as micelles. Then you can do growth, uh, division, growth, division, until you get totally bored, and this can go on forever. So it's, it's a, a beautiful way sorry, of doing uh, indefinite cycles of growth and division, um, and and it relies on on the on the different uh, 
uh, phase uh, properties of, of these uh, very large scale fatty acid aggregates. Now, if you think about the prebiotic geochemical environment that would be required to do this, that this relies on, on a periodic uh, or at least intermittent addition of the, the alkaline fatty acid feedstock. So that's certainly not impossible, but it does require a specific kind of fluctuating environment. So we were also interested uh, at the same time for many years in you know, the question of whether there might be simpler uh, ways to have growth and division going on that might not require this specific cycle of environmental fluctuations. And so our first foray into that uh, kind of thinking came from work that was done by Irene Chen uh, when she was a graduate student uh, in the lab many years ago now. And what Irene demonstrated is that if you prepare these fatty acid vesicles and load them up with a high concentration of stuff, and that stuff can be anything as long as it's relatively impermeable to, to the membrane. So it could be um, sugars like sucrose, it could be nucleotides, it could be even RNA molecules. And she demonstrated this by uh, loading up vesicles with, um, with uh, fragments of RNA and, and show that these vesicles are, are osmotically swollen and, and the membrane is under tension. So it's a high energy state but there's no relaxation pathway if uh, you just have a population of these swollen vesicles. On the other hand, if you mix these vesicles with relaxed vesicles, which are essentially uh, isotonic, so they're not swollen, the membrane is relaxed, then something very interesting happens. The swollen vesicles start to grow and the relaxed vesicles start to shrink. And that process is enabled because of the very fast time scale with which these single chain amphiphiles can leave and enter the membrane. So there's a steady state, so an equilibrium concentration in solution, but very rapid exchange of these molecules between vesicles. And, and so that enables a new relaxation pathway that results in growth of osmotically swollen vesicles. So, we were very excited about this because this seemed like a way to have a direct physical coupling between replication of an RNA-like genetic material and the compartment boundary. So if you had a system where for some reason these RNA molecules were, were replicating, say, more efficiently than in, in other vesicles, the vesicles with the fastest uh, replication of RNA would become osmotically swollen, and then they could grow essentially by eating their neighbors and stealing their lipid molecules. So that uh, uh, physical connection between genome replication and membrane growth was very interesting. However, the more we thought of it, it, it seemed like there's a problem here because we could never figure out a reasonable way of causing these swollen vesicles to divide into smaller daughter vesicles. And that's because if you have a swollen sphere, it's very, it takes a lot of energy to deform that sphere and to cause it to divide. And, and you just from geometry, you have to lose some of the contents, and which, which also seems less than ideal. So it, it was not until a few years later when another uh, brilliant graduate student, Itai Buden, joined the lab that we came to a different way of, of doing a similar process. And, and this came about because Itai was thinking about the transition during evolution from these primitive fatty acid based membranes to more modern phospholipid based membranes. Now these modern membranes uh, because uh, because the, the phospholipid molecules are really tightly and strongly anchored into the membrane, they're less dynamic, you don't have the same exchange processes, and they're also much less permeable to polar or charged molecules. So, and that's in contrast to the properties of these very dynamic and very permeable uh, fatty acid membranes. So then 
you obviously couldn't jump from the primitive situation to the modern situation because in the absence of highly uh, complex evolved machinery like uh, protein channels and pumps and, and so on, um, a cell with a membrane like this would die because it couldn't have access to any food molecules from outside. So if you think of a pathway, it seems logical to have an intermediate state where you have mostly fatty acids in the membrane and maybe a small proportion of phospholipids. But then the question is, well, this would not have an evolutionary effect if there wasn't, there had to be some selective advantage to the presence of these phospholipid molecules in the membrane in, in order for this to be part of an evolutionary transition. So we couldn't think of any reason why it would be good to have a little bit of phospholipid uh, in the membrane. And so Itai just did the experiment. He made vesicles with this kind of mixed uh, membrane composition and looked at their behavior. And remarkably, what he observed is that just like with the swollen, osmotically swollen vesicles, these mixed composition uh, uh, vesicles are essentially stable by themselves. Nothing interesting happens if you just have a population of vesicles like this. But if you mix them with other vesicles that have only got fatty acids in their membrane, you immediately see that the mixed membrane starts to grow and the all fatty acid membrane starts to shrink. And again, the reason is that fatty acids can come and go from these membranes. They can exchange between vesicles on a pretty rapid time scale. And, and so that provides a pathway for the growth, which you can see in this time series of micrographs at the bottom. And again, we see growth into these filamentous shapes, which means that these, after growth, these vesicles can be divided by gentle shear forces. And so again, you can imagine a cycle of growth and division in which vesicles that have phospholipids grow by eating their neighbors, which have no or less fatty acid, less phospholipids. So then the question is, what's the physical mechanism behind this growth? And, and so Itai spent a lot of time working that out. We think there are probably uh, two, two aspects to this that are important. One is a simple entropic effect. So the growth causes a dilution of the phospholipids in this membrane, so that's entropically favored. Um, but there's also an interesting aspect uh, having to do with order in the membrane. So again, here is uh, just a description of, of what we think is going on during growth. So we, we think that, in fact, the off rate of molecules from the mixed membrane is less, slower than the off rate from the all fatty acid membranes. The on rates are the same, and therefore, uh, the mixed membranes grow and the homogeneous membranes uh, shrink. So then in this model, the question is, well, what would account for a slower off rate of fatty acid molecules from mixed composition membranes? And so to look at that and um, to actually see if that was happening, uh, Itai used an assay developed by uh, our colleague James Hamilton, uh, and that works as, as seen here. So if you have uh, a membrane that contains fatty acids. These can come out of the membrane, go into solution, and integrate into other membranes. In this case, a reporter vesicle that contains a pH-sensitive fluorescent dye on the interior. And the way the assay works is that when a fatty acid integrates into the, it, it hits this membrane, it can integrate into the outer leaflet of the bilayer. Only if it's protonated can it flip across the bilayer. And then when the protonated uh, uh, molecule reaches the inside, it re-equilibrates and therefore releases protons. So if this happens, the interior of the reporter vesicle becomes acidic, and you can see that in the change in the fluorescence spectrum of the reporter dye. So just to show you that the assay works, here, we, uh, Itai made uh, uh, vesicles with a series of fatty acids with different chain lengths from 18 carbons, 16 carbons, 14 carbons, and then mixed those vesicles with these uh, pH-sensitive reporter vesicles and followed uh, 
um, the time uh, scale of the of, of the exchange reaction. And as you would expect, the longer chain fatty acids um, it come out have a slower off rate um, than the medium chain fatty acids, which have in turn a slower off rate than the shortest chain fatty acids that we looked at. So the, the more hydrophobic surface area, the, the more the, the hydrophobic tail is held into the membrane and the, and the slower the off rate. Okay, so using that assay, Itai was able to show that indeed the off rate <clears throat> of molecules from uh, membranes was a function of, from fatty acid membranes, was a function of how much phospholipid uh, was also in the membrane. So it goes from uh, a certain fast rate, 7.5 per second for a pure fatty acid vesicle, and then slower and slower and slower as you have more of the two chain uh, phospholipid. So that um, shows pretty directly that growth can, that, that's due to the presence of phospholipids uh, is, is in part due to uh, this difference in, in off rate. And in other experiments that I don't have time to go into, but I'm happy to talk about, Itai showed that this is uh, at least in part due to an increased ordering of the membrane by the two chain phospholipid molecules. Okay, now the infl interesting implication of all of this though is, is the important part. And, and that is that if you have say RNA molecules in here and they're growing and they're replicating and, and by chance a sequence arises that has, for example, an acyl transferase enzymatic ability that could make two chain uh, lipids that vesicle would have an advantage over its neighbors. It could grow by eating its neighbors because it is internally synthesizing two chain lipid molecules. Okay, so it'd have a strong selective advantage. And that means that you would essentially get um, uh, to an evolutionary arm, arms race. So, so the, the logical chain starts from the observation that phospholipids drive uh, growth of fatty acid vesicles. So there'd be a strong selection for a, a, a genetically encoded acyl transferase that could make phospholipids. But then you, that works at the beginning, but eventually the whole population will be taken over by descendants of the original vesicle that has a, this acyl transferase. And now the only way to grow by eating your neighbors is to make more phospholipids than they do. Okay, So there'd be uh, this arms race to make, to evolve, you know, to make more and more phospholipids. And that will start to have very interesting effects as it starts to change the biophysical properties of the membrane. So as the membrane starts to become less and less permeable, there would be an increasing selection for membrane transporters, which might be simple peptides at the beginning. And also for the first time, it would become worthwhile to have internal metabolic reactions going on because any valuable products that are made don't immediately leak out and feed your neighbors. They get to be held inside. So we think that this transformation of membrane composition might have driven the evolution of membrane transporters and metabolism and thereby indirectly uh, driven the evolution of coded uh, protein synthesis. Okay, can I just okay. ask something briefly? Um, yeah, yeah, sure. I was wondering, so, so so you said the fatty acids leave, they have a larger off rate than the phospholipids. So, so so why is this again? Because, I mean, both of them are hydrophobic, but then the phospholipids are charged as well and they have more right. sophisticated side chains or? Okay, so, so, so there are two separate things here. So the phospholipids, a two, any two chain lipid has, you know, roughly twice the, the, hydrophobic surface area. So they're really firmly anchored into the membrane. The phospholipids have extremely low off rates. What we're talking about here is actually the off rates of the fatty acid molecules, which are fastest in a pure fatty acid environment and slower in a membrane that has even a few percent of phospholipids. These phospholipids influence the membrane environment and make it harder for these molecules to leave. 
And we think that's because every phospholipid molecule is actually surrounded by at least uh, a single molecule shell and maybe uh, two or three layers of highly ordered um, fatty acids, uh, which are held in place uh, and, and have a slower off rate. So that's what we think is going on. Okay, uh, just one other thing. Um, yeah. So you mentioned in the beginning, you know, you needed shear to have this protocell division effectively. Um, yes. it, it, it doesn't exist that you, you can't have like uh, fatty acids with, uh, with larger tail head groups or smaller tail groups, so they form an intrinsic curvature. So ah. it would be easy to, to pinch off <laughs> in a certain size. Yeah, that's a very, very interesting point. So, so certainly uh, uh, lipids with you know, different shapes and therefore different intrinsic effects on membrane curvature can play very important roles. We, that's a little bit tricky with single chain lipids, especially fatty acids that can flip across the bilayer very, very rapidly. So the curvature energy tends to get minimized due to fast flip-flop. Um, but that of course depends a lot on, on head group uh, structure. Uh, so there, there's definitely a lot that needs to be explored there. Uh, I should say one of the things that's being looked at uh, more recently are slightly more complicated single chain amphiphiles that have cyclophosphate head groups. And uh, the whole issue of uh, intrinsic curvature or flip flop rates and so on uh, remains to be well studied. Okay, thank you. Sure. Okay, let's see. Okay. So in the, uh, the scenario that I was just talking about, that relied on the evolution of um, genetically encoded molecules with catalytic activity. And so we're thinking about RNA molecules here uh, that are act as ribozymes. Uh, and so this means that we're talking about sequences that have a meaning, right? What's important about the sequence is not the sequence per se, but the fact that it allows that molecule to fold up into a three-dimensional shape that can actually do something useful for the cell that it's in. And so quite a while ago now, that made us start thinking about information that's encode, encoded in, in symbol strings, or in, in a physical example, in the sequence of RNA or, or, or DNA. Uh, and we, we're very interested because that was a time in my lab when we were using uh, CELEX or in vitro selection or directed evolution to evolve RNA molecules with a lot of different functions. So if you just think about information in the, in the very uh, original classical sense, going back to Shannon, the only thing that mattered in this classical information theory is, is, is the actual string. And the important questions at the time and in sort of development of, of uh, computer technology was the accuracy with which a string could be transmitted. Okay, so, but then uh, there's been a series of different ways over time of, of, of looking at sequences. So in, in many sequences, um, of course, you 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 can um, you can reconstruct the the information. You can reconstruct the sequence uh, uh, by essentially a, a, a compression algorithms. And so, there's a definition of information content going back to Kolmogorov called algorithmic complexity, which is essentially, in a way, the shortest. Uh, smallest computer program that you could write that would reconstruct an original uh, sequence. Okay, so it's a little bit more abstract than the original conception. And then going uh, closer to a biological conception of information, this work from uh, uh, Chris Adami uh, in a, a, a view they call physical complexity. And, and this comes from looking at biological sequences and, and aligning uh, sets of sequences that um, that that differ in differ in the sequence, but but which have certain common elements. So, for example, if you line up protein sequences from different organisms, or you line up uh, tRNA sequences either within or between organisms, there are some positions that matter a lot. There are other positions that can vary uh, 
seemingly randomly and, and everything in between. And, and so that gives rise to a measure of information that they refer to as physical complexity. And then uh, we uh, kind of generalized that, 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 that concept a little bit more into something we've called uh, functional information, which takes into account the fact that sometimes there are many different ways of achieving the same function. So you can have different folded shapes with totally different sequences that in a sense do the same thing. And so that further reduces uh, the amount of information that's required to encode a function, which is the meaning of the sequence, okay? So to illustrate that, I'll talk about uh, what, what we actually did in terms of evolving um, RNA sequences. So, so again, the, 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 what we're trying to get at here is, is how much information does it take to encode a given molecular activity, a molecular function? And more specifically, how much more information does it cost to do a job a little bit better? What's, what's the incremental cost in terms of information for an incremental improvement in function? Okay. And to answer these questions, we have to, first of all, uh, go back and think about how we're going to measure information uh, in, in this sense. Okay, so the experiments that gave rise to all, all of this um, uh, are, are essentially directed evolution experiments that work uh, as shown here. We typically will have a starting library of sequences. It could be RNA sequences, for example, or DNA sequences, or even protein sequences. Uh, we take that, that library, which may be completely random sequences, uh, impose a selection on the library that enriches for molecules that do some job we're interested in, for example, binding a molecular target. We amplify the survivors, and we're not perfect at doing the selection, so we have to go around this cycle usually several times or sometimes a lot of times until the population is taken over by molecules that do the job we were interested in. And at that point, you can look at the output, uh, the set of solutions, you can see what they are by, by sequencing and analyze how they work. Okay, so um, uh, we did an experiment um, uh, to look for RNA molecules that could bind as a target, uh, GTP. And in this uh, experiment, some hundreds of sequences were obtained from an initially random uh, library after several rounds of selection. Uh, and a subset of these were screened and characterized and, uh, and a smaller subset were chosen for really detailed uh, analysis. Okay. And this is what um, they look like in uh, what we call a secondary structure representation. So uh, we have some positions where nucleotides can do Watson-Crick base pairing with their partner and make a base paired stem. And at these positions, all that matters is typically not the sequence, but the fact that you can have Watson-Crick uh, base pairs. And so we see a stem here, another stem here, a loop, and then the, this internal loop. And these nucleotides are color coded in accordance with how important their specific identity is. So the ones that are in the, in the dark red really have to be what they are. And there are four possible choices. So it takes two bits of information to encode the identity of each of these nucleotides. Then there are other nucleotides that where some variation can be tolerated. So it takes less information to specify those. And some can be uh, completely uh, random, they can be anything, and so it takes no information to encode those positions. So you can add up everything and get a measure of the informational complexity of this particular structure. And it turned out that in this selection experiment, we got a lot of very different independent solutions. And they had uh, uh, a wide range of uh, affinities for their target molecules. So the strength of interaction with the target varied over a wide range, as did their informational complexity. So I'm just showing four here that were simple stem loops uh, with relatively uh, weak uh, binding to the target. Uh, here's another set of five that, as you can see visually, they're a little bit more complicated uh, and they have uh, higher affinities uh, on generally for their for their target. 
uh, and correspondingly um, uh, different amounts of information. And even a few uh, really complicated looking uh, aptamers, as we call these target binding molecules, uh, which bind very tightly and have very complicated structures. So you can just get a visual um, uh, glimpse of the correlation between complexity and ability to do the job of target binding by, as you can see in this figure, where the, the simplest looking uh, structures bind weakly and the most complicated looking structures bind the most tightly. Okay, so we can look at that in progressively more quantitative ways. So here I'm just graphing the affinity for the target molecule from uh, low on, on the left to high affinity on, on the right against the number of base paired stems. And you can see there's a correlation, more stems, the higher affinity. You can actually just graph the affinity against the number of bits of information required to encode each of those different structures. And you see this correlation here. It's, it's a very noisy correlation, but it's, it's statistically um, uh, significant by the Spearman correlation test. And interestingly, well, one of the interesting things is that it, it seems to take roughly 10 bits of additional information to allow or to encode a tenfold uh, change in the binding affinity, the KD. Okay. So, if okay, so there, there's a lot of scatter in here. We didn't really know what that meant at the time, and but we thought it would be really nice to have more than one example of this. Now, this experiment, uh, obtaining and analyzing all of these different structures, actually took several years of work, so it's not something we wanted to repeat uh, right away. But it turned out that we independently had been looking at some different RNA molecules that we had evolved in the lab. And uh, these are RNAs that are ribozymes, ribozyme ligases. They join fragments of RNA together. Uh, and you can see visually that the one on the left is much more complicated than the one on the right. And in fact, the one, the complicated one is much better as a ligase than uh, the simpler structure uh, on, on the right. And so again, we could go through the same kind of exercise to to add up the amount of information required to specify this structure versus the other structure, and then put them on the same graph. And interestingly, those, it's only two points, but again, the slope uh, of, uh, of the line linking them is, is, again, roughly 10 bits of information to get a tenfold better, uh, in this case, catalytic activity. Okay, so, so what does this all mean then? We have this correlation between information content and function. Uh, one interesting way of viewing the scatter in the plot is that structures below the line are, in a sense, lucky structures. They're, they're structures that can do a job with less information than you might expect on average. And that means if you do this selection again, if you reach into a collection of random sequences, these are the ones you're most likely to find. And so evolution, if there are structures like this, will tend to be deterministic. You'll always find the same simplest structures. On the other hand, if the only structures that can solve the particular problem at hand happen to be very complex, very, they require a lot of information, then you may find different ones every time. Um, the logic behind that is that if you calculate the chance that these structures would have been present in our starting library, they're very, very low, just because it takes so much information to encode these, these structures. We deduce from that that we got these because there are many, many, many others that we didn't happen to get. We think that sequence space is populated with these very complex structures that are very, very rare and so very rarely obtained. That means if you go back into seat random sequence space and, and look for, for new molecules that can solve this functional problem, 
evolution might be contingent in that you contingent on the history. In other words, you would get different solutions every time. Okay. So uh, can I just ask something briefly? Um, yeah. Check. So 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 what about just a stretch of uh, you know poly GC uh, RNA which which folds on onto each other and then you have really strong uh, cheesy base pairs. I mean. You exclude mm -hmm. that. I mean, that would have basically very little information and a very strong binding, but then it's not a ribosome, ribosome, so you 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 wouldn't look at that uh, molecule. That's so right. That... Those those would not have any function in terms of binding the target molecule. So the the here we're selecting for molecules that have folded up in a way that they can recognize a target. Um, okay. By okay. you know forming complementary surfaces and so on. Thanks. Yeah. So simple things like that, just just they fall out because they're not functional. Okay, so uh, one way to look at this, uh, uh, coming back to this idea of functional information, is imagine you took all of the possible sequences, right? So um, um, a sequence of length n, you would have n uh, four to the power of n sequences, and what if you arrange them like a sand pile with the the, the least functional sequences at the bottom and the most functional sequences uh, at the top, then you can see that, you know, for sequences that have no function, it, there's essentially no information content at all. And, and whereas the very best sequence, if this was a, like a unique sequence, uh, would have its information content would be essentially two N bits of information. So for any, cut off at a degree, a certain degree of function, we can define the information required to, to differentiate these function sequences that have this degree of function or better from all of the others as simply minus log two of the fraction of all possible sequences that have greater than some specified activity. So that's our definition of functional information. And, and you can just see visually that it requires more information to encode, encode a higher degree of function. So the questions, and, and there are a lot of, I think, very deep uh, questions that remain to be explored. Um, and and so, so one is, you know, there's obviously more functional information required to specify a given degree of function, but, but why does it take um, so much? What, what, what is it that uh, gives us this correlation between uh, more information and more function, which seems to be uh, e e essentially you have to screen through a thousand times more sequences to find something that that's ten times better. And is is that just a complete uh, one off of no significance, just just from this particular example, or is there something more fundamental uh, at at play here? Um, so, uh, yeah, we'd like to understand whether there are some general laws behind these correlations or it's just idiosyncratic behavior that will be different uh, in every case that's looked at. And at the moment, there is really no theory behind these observations. So I think it's a very interesting uh, area for future exploration. But as I said, these experiments uh, took years to do, and so I think it may be time to take a fresh look at these questions using some of the new technologies that allow us to to look at very large number of uh, numbers of sequences in in, uh, in much with much less time and effort. So, Jack, just to, yeah. just to go back a step. So, yeah. when you when you say um, the 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 entropy of a of a of a um, of a given aptima or the rib or the ribozyme, yeah. is you 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 deduce it from the um, how much variability the sequence has whilst it still functions, right? And how is that whilst it still functions defined? Is it still functions relative to the best of that class, or is it like relative to an absolute baseline? Yeah, that's a very good question. So. The way that I think in retrospect, the way that this experiment was done was it's not what you'd really like to do, right? Ideally, you'd like to be able to just sort through random sequences and measure their activity, 
and get a distribution of activity versus frequency. What, what we essentially had to do was look at, you know, identify these different ways of doing something and, um, and then look at the, at the sequence and the sequence changes that were compatible with a, a very high level of activity. So we didn't really account for all of the lower activity versions of a particular sequence. So that's a very good point and a, definitely a limitation of that study. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I just wanted to circle back to questions of the origin of life. And, and so as we're getting closer to actually developing uh, replicating protocells in the lab, we want to follow their evolution and we want to do that by using deep sequencing technology. What we can do so far is, is look at the extent and accuracy of our ability to copy sequences using this non-enzymatic chemistry. So we have, for example, random template regions in a hairpin, we copy the template and then sequence um, what, what got copied. Where we're headed is adapting this to, to sequencing uh, small fragments of RNA and hopefully small fragments that are replicating inside replicating um, protocells. And so we're looking forward to being able to actually follow the evolution of these evolving protocells in real time. And so uh, I think I'll uh, stop there. And I just want to say that, of course, you know, this all of this work was done by incredibly talented and brilliant uh, graduate students and postdocs over many, many years. And I've, I've listed here some of the people that contributed to uh, some of the work that I talked about. So thank you very much and uh, happy to answer any additional questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let's see. Got it. Thanks very much. Um, yeah. It'd be good to have your face back, I guess. We can always go back. You can always go back yeah. to the... Uh, the uh, <laughs> uh, just trying to remember now how to stop. I think the X, the X in the middle of your screen at the bottom, left of that. Yeah. Uh, there's an X. Hmm. You've now stopped sharing your screen, so... Oh, you should, oh I have. You now be okay. able to click on the video icon. Um, okay. Yes. Brilliant. So I had one more question. Uh, if other people can start, well, either I guess raise hands or, or write questions into the into the comments, and, and we'll crack on. But I had one more question, which is when you talked about the the growth with osmotic pressure. Yeah. Uh, and the and you suggested that maybe an RNA something that effectively made RNA would be able to would generate more internal osmotic pressure and therefore would, would grow faster. Is that like dependent on these protocells actually being able to hoover stuff up from their environment? Because it wasn't obvious to yeah. me that, yeah. that the RNA itself would have more osmotic pressure than its constituent molecules. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so um, a good question. There are several points. So these these Vesicles that are fatty acids, or at least mostly fatty acids, are very permeable to small uh, polar or even charged molecules like nucleotides. So they can take up nucleotides from the environment and they can release, um, you know, end products. But larger oligos, RNA is longer than roughly four nucleotides or so, are trapped inside. So ribozymes, uh, for example, would be trapped inside. The osmotic pressure actually mostly comes from the cloud of counter ions uh, surrounding the RNA. And so as you, um, as you build up these larger RNAs that are trapped inside, but have the small sort of feedstock molecules in an equilibrium of exchange, then yeah, you would have an increased osmotic pressure. Okay, yeah. Okay, that makes sense. I think I didn't appreciate the degree of um, porosity of the of the vesicles. So That's really a remarkable property of these fatty acid vesicles that that such charged molecules can get across them, and it's totally different from phospholipid 
uh, membranes where you require this highly complex evolved uh, machinery to get molecules across. I, I think Bavin, is that your name? Has, has raised a hand, so go ahead. Hi there, um, that was a really nice talk, thank you. Um, so a lot of work I've done is looking at this field of genotype phenotype maps and mm -hmm. the population genetics and things like that of that and you actually find a very similar sort of principle so it's like protein transcription factor dna binding it's a similar thing so if we for you to get the, the best binder you want all your sequences to be you know perfectly matched between dna and uh, the protein and the mm -hmm. binding interface and so the number of sequences that then give you worse binding goes up and up and up Right, and right. so you have this competing entropic effect and, you actually, and then similar sorts of models of protein stability so the question you know why are proteins marginally stable um mm. is a often asked question when they can be very very much more stable and a uh, similar models right. of simulations of protein stability say actually as you go to more and more stable solutions or proteins, you have fewer and fewer sequences that give you right. that stability. Right. And then you can do all sorts of population genetic things to see the interplay with genetic drift. So it's all quite yeah, interesting. So I think it is the basic principle, but I don't think it's it, been, yeah, there's yeah, no, a I theory think, that explains it. Right, I, th I think the, the beautiful thing about being able to do these experiments with molecules that have been evolved in vitro is that you can, focus the functional aspect on one property whereas in any biological system as you said there's there's so many different uh, selective forces all yep, uh, yep. acting in parallel on for example stability you know ability to have turnover and, and, and so on and so forth so yeah i i really hope that at some point we, we or somebody will, will work out the basic principles underlying this connection between uh, function and information. No, oh, yeah, exactly. Thanks. Thanks. I, I can ask something. If Ismail, your camera's on, did you want to ask anything? No. Okay, then. Uh, at the beginning of your talk, um, uh, Jack, you talked about the, um, the, the meteorites and the, and the different chirality and said, I think you showed one graph with or two graphs actually. So did it show essentially that meteorites generally have one more predominance than the other one or can it vary from meteorite to meteorite? So the predominance of the left or right handed one. Well, that, so that's the interesting thing is that uh, it uh, seems to be always the L uh, yeah. amino acid enantiomer that is more abundant than the D. Okay. And obviously it's just 50-50 whether that had anything to do with the fact that we see L amino acids in biology, but but it's it's the and, same yeah, enrichment okay. in many independent. Uh, I mean, hence examples. it puzzle basically, yeah, okay. And um, yeah, I mean, from where do these amino acids come from in the first place in the in the meteorites? I mean, is it known, or is there some speculation? Yeah, it, there. So the chemical pathway is um, could be. Um, uh, sorry, I'm just um, blanking out. There, there's a simple chemical pathway through. Uh, formation of amino nitriles, the Strecker reaction, which is thought to be the simplest way, but uh, there, there's new work going on to try to actually work out in more detail the chemical pathways that gave rise to these amino acids. So that, that's still an active area of study. Okay, thanks. Uh, Slava uh, has a hand up and Damien. So I guess Slava first. Oh yeah, sorry. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. 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 Sorry. I think I think my question was just answered. So it was it was basically about whether it's understood how a particular chirality can be uh, facilitated by the light or by the um, uh, spin spin polarized electrons. Uh, so 
I think I, so. So as I understand, it's still much to to study there. Oh yes, for sure. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, uh, Damien. Then I guess. Um, hi, um, that was an amazing talk. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm just trying to understand the functional complexity idea a bit more. So, so I think it's really interesting. Um, it's an interesting concept. So if I try to imagine two extreme examples, one might be um, I just want a specific RNA of length, let's say five, that binds to something um, perfectly, right? So there'll be one sequence that does that. The, the, the let's say the length five sequence that perfectly matches another RNA toehold or something. So there's, um, you know, a fraction of, um, there's only a very small fraction of the length N sequences that, that bind at that length, length N position, right? And then you yeah. can have something much more promiscuous where any length N sequence would bind. So that's, okay, so that's the kind of 1D case. And then if we generalize and think about 3D, so it seems like if you're thinking about, let's say binding only, right, specificity of binding, yeah then sort of the functional complexity somehow seems like it would be a function of uh, the volume or maybe the area of the 3D object plus um, um, the awkwardness, the awkwardness of the positions of the things that you want yeah. to bind to, right? Yeah. If they're in a regular nice pattern, it's easy to bind there, but if there's some awkward uh, positioning of atoms that you need to bind to. So, and then just to also say that Indeed, as you get longer and longer sequences, then they sort of become useless, right, for binding because you're wanting to bind to a 3D object of a certain kind. Well, that's, and then, that's a whole other question is the influence of sequence length. So yeah, that's how that would influence the outcome, I think is also unknown. It, it's, it's on the one hand, there, would, there are more places within a long sequence where you could have a functional domain arise. On the other hand, there are more ways to wreck a functional sequence by adventitious interaction. So then, yeah, it becomes very complicated. Yeah, and, and, and in a finite volume, there's more kind of wastage. You can have to get specificity, like the enzymes are kind of large objects, but they bind a tiny substrate. But then at some point it becomes too big and too useless. So that it's a measure of complexity that's somehow aware of these subtleties, all of these things I just said, I guess. All these things have to be taken into account, I agree. And, and um, But, you know, if you look at the two ribozyme ligases that we evolved, um, so that, that was done by Dave Bartel, and Dave went to a lot of effort to make a really long random sequence pool. And in retrospect, we're really glad that he did because he would not have gotten that really good ligase if he'd made only a shorter pool, right? Because that structure is just a big structure. And then, you know, if you look at something like the ribosome, it's huge, right? I mean, those, those RNAs are, you know, thousands long, but they clearly evolved stepwise, right? The catalytic core is relatively small, a couple of hundred mm -hmm. maybe. And then it's sort of, got better at what it does by creating a, almost what people sometimes call an exoskeleton of, of other domains that control the that control the structure. So, but there you get into, there's no longer just one simple measure of function because there, there are a lot of things going on at the same time. I think to look at, at this in a really fundamental way, we need to have the simplest simplest possible function, which for me, that's just binding. You know, even when you get into catalysis, there are, there are things of shape complementarity, but also ability of the shapes to change, to be dynamic, to have, you know, ground state as well as transition state binding gets much more complicated. Yeah, very interesting. Thank you. Is that there... Are there any other questions from other people? Damien's the, the only one with his hand up at the moment. Ah, that I can see. Um, so one thing that's very close to my heart is the, um, you talked, um, you said at one point, oh, here's a mechanism for producing new uh, 
uh, like having division and producing new uh, vesicles. And then you said uh, this mechanism requires, you know, um, temporarily varying external conditions. Uh, and I think yes. you talked about yes. injection, but maybe also the agitation would have also had to vary over time as well. Um, we in our group are very big on trying to design things where everything comes from just the chem, just like a continuous chemical bath. Mm -hmm. um, how early do you do you think that actually kicked in? Because because obviously people talk about um, life getting started. Usually they talk about cyclic conditions allowing life to get started. And at what at what point was do you think that everything was kind of internally chemically driven rather than relying <laughs> on the outside world? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I, I think it might have it might have uh, well, there's a related question I think we also have to talk about, which is, you know, if if early on cells are relying on the environment for all their building blocks, right? I mean that you don't have internal metabolism, so you have to get stuff from outside. And then the question is, well, to go through the pathways involved to say make nucleotides, to make amino acids, to make lipids, how many different environments does that require? You know, can that all happen in one time and place? Or do you need to build up intermediates, have conditions change, and sort of build up another reservoir and then Maybe at the end, you have a reservoir of all the right building blocks that can then feed one environment where protocells are growing and dividing. And yeah, I totally agree. Does that environment where the protocells are living, does that have to be fluctuating in any particular way? Or could it be yeah. relatively constant? You know, th those are all the kinds of questions that we're, we're trying to get at. Yeah, I mean, I, I have a, I have a suspicion. I mean, I don't really know. I'm not, I'm not, I don't know enough of the sort, this sort of deep chemistry to, to, to answer the question. But, but actually, things probably got quite sophisticated by the time they were not reliant on external fluctuations to drive the simple processes. But I don't really know. I, I think that that's kind of my intuition that early on. Um, you know, when when protocells are dependent on the environment, that that they may have required fluctuations in the environment to enable these cycles of growth and division. But we actually have to be able to build structures that can grow and divide to really see. Yeah. You know, yeah. are right. there different ways of doing it? No, I mean, hundred percent agree. Um, I, Andrea uh, has raised right hand, so I will. If, uh... Hi, thank you. Thank you for a very, very nice talk. Um, a very quick question. Do you think that to propagate information more efficiently, uh, do you do you have to share information, uh, share functions? So, as for example, instead of having a sequence that has a perfect function or a very high affinity for, let's say, a ligand, instead having a compromise so that's a sequence that has an affinity for maybe two or three different things in this case it has multiple functions and then the penalty right. for losing that function is much bigger because you will lose more than one thing at the same time instead of having one single function and i think this could be applied in general also for proteins uh, or even in in uh, more complex systems let's say that that could have multiple functions yeah yeah, no, that, that, that's a really interesting aspect in, in, in terms of, you know, the evolution of functions. Is it, is it more likely to start off with at a relatively sort of promiscuous state where an ancestral sequence can do a lot of different things, maybe none of them very well, but can do different things. And then by duplication, you can specialize and, and get get new sequences that are better, you know, with with RNA, with with proteins, I think that's that's quite um, feasible. You, you can yeah. have proteins that are relatively promiscuous. With RNA molecules, I think the situation is not so clear. And it may be, I mean, we've tried to evolve RNAs from doing one job into doing another job. And we never get things that do both 
you know, right. m only moderately well. We kind of jump from one structure to another. So the fitness landscape with RNA may be much more rugged and may mm. just not work in that way. But, you know, again, there are so few examples. It's, it's, I think it's premature to make any kind of general principle out of it. We need yeah. to, you know, look more at this. But maybe like something like uh, binding and maybe structural uh, effect. Yeah. So like yeah. maybe not sure. on the same landscape, but uh, yes. multiple yeah. landscape effects. And then in this case, you could yeah. have better retention of information. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, we, there, there are plenty of more or less globular RNA structures that have been solved, right? right? And you can easily imagine small modifications allowing them to, to form filaments and Maybe you can make a whole uh, cytoskeleton out of, uh, out of <laughs> RNA, for example. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Sure. Yeah, there's no one else um, to go. Thank you very much for the exciting talk. Um, so ribozymes can, from, from what I gather, have a lot of different sorts of enzymatic activities. There's lots of potential ways yeah. that they could catalyze reactions. But one very special one for the origin of life is the ability to catalyze its own formation, right? Yes. Um, and I'm wondering about what order did these things have to come in? Could you have had the prevalence of non self replicating ribozymes prior to the evolution of a, a self replicating system? And what are the, s the steps in enzymatic, enzymatic activity that you might need to make the self replicator? Yeah. Okay, so uh, I can tell you the way we're thinking about it now. Um, so we've been working for the last, I don't know, <laughs> several years now on, on how to make non-enzymatic RNA copying and replication work better. So I'm, I've come around to thinking that the first ribozyme to evolve might have had nothing to do with replication. It could be something functional like, you know, making being an acyl transferase that could either make two chain lipids or make, you know, make peptides or something like that. Then once you have a ribozyme that does something useful for the protocell that it's in, then it's very important to replicate that ribozyme sequence more efficiently and accurately. And that would drive evolution of replication machinery, including the, this long hypothesized RNA replicase. Uh, but there there are many, many, many enzymatic activities that can facilitate replication in a, you know, beyond or in addition to just a, a polymerase function. Um, so the order in which those evolved is, 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 is not clear. But as the replication machinery gets better and can handle the replication of longer sequences, you know, at higher fidelity, that would in turn allow the evolution of, of new ribozymes that do other functional jobs, metabolic jobs, for example, or, or structural jobs. So I think w once you get going, then it can kind of expand exponentially. Location and the, the various activities feed on each other. So, so is that to say that there might not have this this self copying machine might not have arisen first, possibly didn't need to arise, but a machine that could catalyze the production of other molecules that perhaps have interesting effects in yeah. a sort of um, uh, kind of generic way. You know, it could form many different molecules, or perhaps even form itself might have been useful. Yeah, I think I'm. I, 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 I guess what I'm just trying to say is that a replicase may not have come first, but some some other useful activity might have come first. We don't know what that activity might have been, but any any other activity that's useful for a cell could come first, and then you have selection for better replication, and then that allows more new functions to evolve. Oh, 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 sorry Thank to you. interrupt, but whatever that mechanism is, you got to be able to make copies of it. Yeah, so we, we think that initially you have a, a, a purely chemical, a non-enzymatic mode of RNA replication. I think we're getting closer to 
being able to do that in the, in the lab, but okay, again, it's it's a hypothesis at this point. Okay, I see what you're saying. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Is it just Geordie's hand that's up at the moment, or is somebody else's? Okay. Well. Um, if there are no more questions, um, thank you very much, Jack. That was a great talk, and I think we've had a, a good chat after the um, end as well. I hope you found it interesting as well. Um, yeah, that, that was great. Thanks, for, uh, everyone, for all the good questions. Uh, yeah. And, uh, yeah, enjoy, enjoy, enjoy the day, which is still young for you, I guess. Um, <laughs> That's right. Yeah, um, yeah. Great. Well, um, Thanks to everyone who stayed with us and um, we will be updating you in due course on the, the rest of the seminars for the term. Uh, cheerio, okay. thanks right. everyone. Thanks very much. Okay, bye. Bye everyone.